The best dental splint in the whole world is a splint. Hi guys and welcome to Splint Timber. It's finally the episode about splints we've been waiting for. Starting off with which is the best splint? Like this is such a big question. Which splint is your go-to splint? Uh, and basically, um, uh, you know, you're gonna hear about my journey with splints, people who've influenced me, mentored me, but I'm gonna get right into it very quickly. Where, you know, I was gonna tell you what are the factors which I look for to determine which is the best splint for a patient I have. So since I posted about Splint Timber on Facebook and Instagram, everyone's been sending me a lot of love and you know, everyone's looking forward to it, which has been so amazing. It's a, it's a really confusing topic. Uh, for me, my interest in splints grew out of frustration. And I'll, I'll talk about that uh, in a moment, but thank you so much for everyone sending their love. Uh, one of the listeners, Taha Alibai, actually messaged me on Instagram to say, you know, I, I really like this Splint Timber idea, but for October, can you do Auth October or Orthrontober? Try and get all the orthrontic systems to sort of almost debate ag against each other to see which is the best orthrontic system. And I thought that's really clever. It's a great idea. But I'm abs I might have to say that till next year, for example, when uh, everyone has enough time to prepare and stuff. But thank you so much, everyone, for your suggestions. The protrusive dental pearl, even though it's a splint episode, I'm going to give you like a, a non-splint uh, sort of pearl. And this is something I posted on my Instagram just a few days ago. Check out at Jazzy Gulati for the Instagram. And this is how I like to remove temporary crowns and temporary onlays. I use a, a hemostat or a mosquitoes or artery forceps, lots of words for them. And if it's a posterior one, I like to use the curved ones. Uh, and basically, you squeeze your temporary crown or temporary onlay, and that breaks apart any bonds that you have. So for example, for an onlay, I would use uh, zinc polycarboxylate cement, such as Durolon, for example, is a popular brand. Uh, and I would squeeze the onlay. That would just um, compress it, and that compression actually causes tensile stress at your sort of bond layer or, or the cement layer. Uh, and that just gets really weak, and suddenly you can just sort of very easily shake it off. If you've got a really thick crown, you know, like normal, even if you use conventional techniques, like, you know, using what I used to use, like a, a big excavator, a Mitchell's, a carver, something like that, and try and flick up, it's not so pleasant, it's not so successful in my hands, uh, and sometimes you're just unable to get the temporary crown off, so you have to section it. So sometimes with a really thick crown, you, you'll struggle. Uh, and also be careful with thin teeth, like lower incisors, or quite weak teeth because you don't want to put all those sort of talking loads, especially for a crown rather than onlay. Onlays are so much easier to, you know, with their innate lack of resistance form. So I hope that protrusive dental pearl uh, helped you uh, and I look forward to sharing more with you. So let's go straight to the episode now. Right, so which is the best dental splint? So I was incredibly confused by splints uh, for many years uh, and to some degree, there's so much about splints, uh, you know, that we all still have so much to learn as a profession. The evidence base for splints is poor. And I think that's a big reason why that we, we, we as a profession get so confused about splints and why there's so much opinion out there. So I, I think it starts at dental school where if you go to your restorative lectures, your lecturer will tell you that the Michigan or the Tanner splint is the best. And that's the only acceptable appliance there is anytime ever. That's it. Um, and if you don't know what any of these appliances mean, any of the ones I, I mentioned, don't worry, we're going to cover all those uh, in, in future episodes. So yeah, restorative will tell you that the Michigan Tanner is great. Uh, and, and restorative will tell you that anyone who gives an anterior only appliance, so let's call them anterior midpoint st stop appliances, so AMSA, um, is an evil, evil dentist uh, and bad things will happen to the patient. The patient will spontaneously combust or uh, get an AOB for sure and in temporomandibular disorder and all that sort of stuff, you know? So, so I was always taught that, you know, stay away from anterior only appliances. Now, in that same dental school, when you had your oral surgery uh, sort of sessions uh, or oral medicine sessions, and they would make the diagnosis of quote unquote TMD, then everyone would get a soft splint. And the Max Faxler oral surgery department would swear that, you know, it's a bright raising appliance and it has a very high success rate and you don't really need anything else. So already coming out of dental school, we have these mixed signals. And then coming into practice uh, and actually trying to make appliances because you want to best serve your patients, you want to sort of help them out, you think they're bruxing and you think that the splint 
might even stop them bruxing. So that's what you used to think, you know, give them the splint and they'll stop bruxing. Even, even patients say it. Patients say to you, oh, um, um, I had an appliance once or I was given a splint once to help me stop bruxing. And I, and I correct the patients. I say, you know what? Nothing will stop you bruxing except maybe fixing the root cause, but I don't go that deep with them. We'll talk about the root causes of bruxism, parafunction and that sort of stuff, only because it's interesting. Um, it, it only helps you, and I say this to a patient, it only helps you to manage your grinding. Uh, you'll still grind, but to do it on a piece of plastic is so much better than doing it on your own teeth. So that's why I say to patients. Trialing splints on patients uh, and, and having some failures early on, uh, failures, all sorts of different types of failures, and we'll cover the different type of failures there are, and then really losing faith in splints, and then really still being so, so confused as to which is the best splint. And then you come, come across some very well-respected clinicians and lecturers who educate on anterior only appliances. And you think, hang on a minute, this is the same splint that dental school told me to stay away from. What is going on? So before I go any deeper, I just want to pay respect to some of the, the, the splint mentors I have, uh, some of the people who have influenced my thinking on appliances, uh, some of the people who really mentored me and helped me uh, and helped me to understand a lot. So before I continue any further, uh, I want to thank Dr. Pav Kyra from the UK, who sort of started to get me think that anterior only appliances or AMPSs are not as bad as people say they are. Uh, and then I was influenced by Jim Boyd and Barry Glassman, who uh, I believe they're the ones who came up with the NTI appliance. Uh, so I used to place a lot of those and uh, they really influenced me. They had a lot of sort of educational content for free uh, on YouTube and whatnot, which um, at the time, maybe four or five years ago, when I started getting, getting into this, uh, that was all there was really. Uh, I'm hoping to change that obviously, but that was really helpful for me at the time. Uh, also helpful to me has been uh, Dr. Mike Melkers, okay, uh, who's obviously coming to November for Occlusion 2020. Uh, at the end of November, that's 27th and 28th of November for Occlusion 2020 program, two-day workshop, which we're really looking forward to. But what he, you know, taught me about splints is, is you know, just unparalleled with anything else. He really took it at that next level for me and also clarified a few designs, which I use very commonly now. So uh, Dr. Melkers, thank you so much. I know you listened to this, so thanks so much for, for helping me in my journey with splints. And, and lastly, Dr. Kushal Gadia, who's a restorative consultant here in the UK, who taught, you know, everything I know about Michigan splints, you know, it comes from him. Uh, and he he's taught me so much so well on his, on his courses, but I love that he's so humble because when I met him on his on his course, uh, he knew that I was doing a lot of anterior only appliances. Uh, and instead of like some of the consultants that I've, I've come across for who really, you know, look down on you and poo poo you, he really kept an open mind. You know, he said, Jazz, you know, I'm gonna listen to one of your episodes and, and try and figure it out. Even though I don't provide anterior only appliances, he really wanted to understand my viewpoint and my experiences uh, and, and sort of was happy to do that myth busting session. Uh, I think it was episode eight, uh, myth busting about uh, anterior only appliances, do they cause AOBs and whatnot. So I, I respect that so much that someone at his level will give up some time to try and understand where a young dentist is coming from with his experience of splints. So um, a massive shout out to him. We need more people like you, Kushal, who will keep an open mind. Now, before we dive into the, the meat of the episode, where I'm gonna tell you straight up, which is the best splint, um, a lot of the sort of best way to think about splints was actually covered in episode 15, Your Occlusion Questions Answered by Dr. Michael Melkers. And I'm going to play you this two minute or three minute extract from this episode where Dr. Michael Melkers gives the best summary for splints that I really want you to hear again. It's just fantastic. So listen to this bit uh, and, and it'll get you, get you thinking about what is the role of a splint? Uh, one thing I want to speak about before we talk about your upcoming program is um, splint therapy. My gosh, people are so confused about splints. It's one of the most controversial topics. It gets a lot of uh, questions uh, when anytime anyone posts on, on social media about splints. And there are, like all parts of dentistry and occlusion as well, there are very polarizing views. And we can go into the whole anterior midpoint stop appliances and uh, those who are really against it and whatnot. But, but one thing I want to uh, uh, just talk to you about is that, or tell you, is that your DASA, so dual arch, anterior midpoint stop line protocols that you showed were was amazing uh, and and uh, the way the cases that you showed and the application of of confirming conf uh, confirming centric relation prior to rehabilitation and you talked about the different indications 
that was great and i've been using that in, 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 you know in a lot of my patients and it's been a, a real game changer for me so um i'm glad, glad you've had success with that i'm using that all the time in practice uh you know in the right indications and i'm seeing great success with it so can you tell us uh, just you know briefly to anyone who's not familiar with these sort of appliances is why uh, you think they um have a, a place in in in, in practice is that too broad <laughs> No, but I would actually probably even want to make it broader, is why would you use any appliance to begin with? And that's where I always want to start. I always want to start with the why. We get into arguments, as you say, and we get into disagreements because people have their what and their how, and they want everybody to do their same how. Like, you have to do my how. You have to use my how. My appliance is the right one. My, my, this, this, this. But in so many of those discussions, we're missing the why. So why do we use orthotics? Why do we use occlusal splints? Why do we use bite guards, night guards? What, whatever you want to call them. There are just a few very simple reasons why we use them. We use them to get people out of pain. We get use them to help protect things. And we use them to help figure things out. Palliative, protective, diagnostic. So if someone is hurting, and they could be hurting in their teeth, they could be hurting in their muscle, or they can be hurting in their joint, they need a palliative splint. I don't care what design it is. If someone is breaking their teeth or breaking their restorations, and they want to keep those restorations intact, then they need a protective splint. Now, if we need to figure something out, whether it's in other camps that want to figure out chewing patterns, or my approach if we want to figure out parafunctional patterns, or if it is important for a joint position, then it is a diagnostic approach. And you can use full arch appliances for all of those applications, and you can use anterior midpoint stops for all of those applications. It goes back to the exact same thing that we were talking about at the beginning of this uh, chat, is we have a lot of tools, but we have to have goals, and then we have to balance efficiency with them. So there we are, protective, palliative, diagnostic. That's it. If you can just categorize your splints in those three sections, everything becomes so much easier. So almost the sort of, the, the, uh, you know, people, a lot of people on the protrusive dental community ask for a flowchart of this, and you'll see in this episode why it's so complex to make a flowchart. But at the very top, you should always bear that in mind, whether your splint is protective, palliative or diagnostic and we'll get into that a little bit more uh, as the weeks come by so doctor thank you dr michael Melkers, for for inspiring us with with that sort of just a simple and beautiful sort of viewpoint on how to choose the best splint so the best dental splint in the world is called a g splint the g stands for my surname gulati uh, and i'll be telling you all about the g splint i'm very much against um having giving blanket prescriptions of splints but uh, hear me out for a second why the g splint maybe the best splint. Okay, so in no particular order, let's look at the first factor I would consider. Uh, again, this is random order. I've got you know, four or five different points, which makes the best dental splint. Okay, so number one, the G splint is the best splint because it's the one that actually addresses the diagnosis. So too many people give blanket prescriptions of, of everything, you know, uh, I will do a vertical preparation for all preparations uh, because they are the most conservative or whatever or I will do a one specific type of procedure for every scenario because it works in my hands or whatever. So a lot of, you know, you know dentists who will only ever give a Michigan or a Tanner and that's it, nothing else. And you know what, they'll have a, a reasonably high success rate in general. But you have to ask yourself, is that practitioner sort of prescribing it based on individual needs and diagnoses or out of habit? So the first thing is, Diagnosis, like, is it a, a joint? Is it a bony issue? Is it a muscle issue? Or are, are you trying to just put something between the teeth to protect them? So what, what are you trying to achieve? Um, maybe it's two or, or, or three of those things. Uh, and maybe they're just completely asymptomatic and, and they are just chipping and wearing away their teeth and they're concerned. So really, it depends on your diagnosis, uh, the health of the joint, health of the muscles, uh, their sort of Initiating, initiating factors, are they a daytime or a nighttime parafunctional patient? Uh, are they bruxing during the day, night? All these factors are part of your diagnosis and that's an important thing to consider, don't you think? Number two, 
compliance. Now, this is a huge one, okay? Uh, many years ago, I used to do lots of Michigan splints and Tanner splints. And, you know, once again, if you don't know what these are, these are full coverage appliances, hard acrylic traditionally. Now, you can actually do the, the bilaminar type. A lot of dentists are against these, but they're soft on the inside and hard on the outside and they have the whole canine ramps for, for disclusion and whatnot. Uh, but essentially, you know, these splints are are supposed to be made ideally using a face bow and, and you know two or three long appointments to get them perfectly equilibrated. But the number of appliances that I've seen that patients own that come from other practices, you know, and I asked them, oh, you know, tell me about how this splint was made. It was, oh yeah, just one appointment. They gave it to me. I went home. That's it, done. And you check their bite and they've almost got like an, an AOB on this splint and you know it's supposed to be a Michigan Rotana. So how many of these appliances are actually really truly and properly equilibrated. I don't think very money. So compliance is a huge factor. And when I used to give uh, these uh, Michigan and Tan appliances uh, with all the best intentions, uh, all the best experience, uh, and really trying to get the best for my patient, it was so disheartening and embarrassing for both me and the patient. When the patient would come back for recall, I'd be like, hey, how are you getting along with that splint? We spent a good few hours on that. You know, we checked your bite over and over again. Uh, how are you getting on with it? And there, you know, they say, you know, I tried for the first couple of weeks and, and to be fair, I, you know, I couldn't get myself to wear it anymore. Uh, I kept removing it in the middle of the night uh, and now I don't even know where it is anymore. So compliance is such a huge factor because you can have the best splint in the world, the best equilibrated splint in the world, but if your patient doesn't wear it, then it's completely pointless. So that is another factor to consider. So the G splint will be the one that will also help with compliance for the patient. And, and that depends on patients. Some patients will comply better than others. Um, that might be a personality type trait. That might be uh, just something innate about them. So something to you want to suss out about them. Okay, number three, the best splint is the one that will also consider their orthodontic status. Now, so many of our patients receive orthodontics. Like, did you know in the UK, uh, when they sort of uh, budget in the uh, national health system uh, and they allocate some funds to, to children's braces and orthodontics under the NHS, they budget that one in three children will require orthodontics. One in three, that's huge. So imagine uh, the patient of tomorrow, one in three of them will, ha will, have, will have had some com comprehensive orthodontics from the NHS uh, and a significant chunk of patients would have paid privately because maybe they didn't meet the criteria for, for IOTN. So. Maybe up to 40% of our patients in the future may have had some degree of orthodontics at some stage. So don't you think before you give an appliance that you should ask if they're currently wearing retainers at the moment, uh, whether they have had orthodontics before and whether they need retention or not. And perhaps an appliance or a splint that not only addresses the diagnosis, the, the sort of the reason for giving a splint, is it diagnostic, is it palliative, is it protective, but also factors in a degree of orthodontic retention if it's necessary. So that's another thing that the best splint will actually address. Does the patient need orthodontic retention? The next one's also very important to consider is it's airway. You know, I recorded some episode, uh, episodes ago with uh, Professor Amma Johal about airway and our, our role, our growing role in the future uh, in dentistry to help patients with airway issues. And there's a huge correlation between airway issues, I'm talking sleep apnea, the inability to get enough oxygen when you're sleeping because it collapses the airway, the soft tissue airway. Uh, and basically, this is um, one of the implicated theories of why people brux and parafunction. Because if you're not able to get the air in, then your muscles mastication, they sort of uh, go all over the place to try and allow you to get more air inside. And the other thing is a uh, gas gastric esophageal reflux disease is also implicated in bruxism and parafunction because you're trying to move your jaw around to get more saliva. So these are some of the theories, but there's a huge link that if you treat someone's airway with a CPAP, for example, uh, one of those positive continuous air, air machines, um, that they all stop parafunctioning. Isn't that so fascinating? So shouldn't you consider that, you know, yes, you have a dental appliance, you want to give it to them, but their airway is important because if it's their airway causing the issue, then perhaps going down that path and perhaps them not even needing an appliance anymore. Or if you just ask them, and typically if it's like a, a 50 year old man who's looking a little bit thick around the neck uh, and, and then you sort of discuss with them uh, and you have to sometimes be frank and ask them, you know, if you already have it in your questionnaire, then great. But if you don't have it, you sometimes have to ask them, do you snore? 
And then a lot of times they'll say, yes, it's a huge problem in my, in my life. My wife is about to divorce me because of it or whatever. It's a massive, massive issue, usually for the spouse rather than the patient who actually snores. But it is actually as a, as a, you know, a marriage breaker. And if, you, if I find out from my patient that snoring is a huge issue and I'm seeing signs of power function, then at the very least, I might offer them an anti-snoring appliance. Because, hey, if that's in the way of the teeth, then they can't damage their teeth anymore. And if they can help their snoring and help their, their spouse get a better night, then the G-splint will be one that also considers their airway. So have a think about that in the future. I mean, I think one of the reasons in the UK, and, and we discussed this in the previous episodes, is that we lack, we're really sort of lagging behind Australia and the USA in terms of managing airway and dentistry, is that we don't have the correct pathways or referral pathways set up. Like we always have to send to the GP first, who may not know much about sleep apnea, and they are the ones responsible to send them to ENT or something, and they might just say to the patient, oh, you know, just lose some weight or whatever, which is good advice, but it's not going to be, uh, you know, helping them with these sleep studies which are needed and all these sort of issues. So I think that's why we sort of lag behind the UK. So there's so much more I need to learn about airway as well. But it's something I would definitely consider when choosing the best splint. So consider the airway when you're prescribing the best appliance for your patient. Okay, the next point to consider for the best appliance is how much do you trust your patient? And how much does your patient trust you? Now, what I mean by that is obviously we want to have a very trusting patient-dentist relationship, but not all of your patients trust you as much as your favorite patient, maybe, uh, and you don't trust all your patients as much as you trust your favorite patient, if that makes sense. So trust varies amongst different patients uh, and how much the patients trust you. Like they might trust you enough to do a composite on the lower six, but they might not trust you enough to do a full mouth rehab, for example, or anything cosmetic, whatever. So trust is a huge factor because if you're going to prescribe them an appliance that has very specific instructions, for example, only wear this appliance at nighttime, not in the day, then can you trust your patient to follow this advice? Because if the proverbial hits the fan and things go wrong, then you want to be able to, to have a patient that actually followed the instructions. Because when patients follow the instructions of an appliance and you have put thought and care into the correct prescription of the correct appliance for that patient, then you're not going to run into any issues. But when there's a lack of trust, i.e. between you not trusting the patient to, to, to do things correctly, or a massive one is patient not trusting you. If I have a patient in front of me and I'm getting these vibes that, you know, they're listening to me, but I don't think they're taking anything in. So, for example, uh, it's one of those patients there that you that you show them their photos and you show them all their signs of severe uh, power function, uh, completely flat incisors that, you know, four millimeters of, you know, incisor height left. And then they're looking at you, they're listening, but they don't, they're not trusting you. They're not buying into it. They don't agree maybe this is the first time maybe that you know someone's telling them uh, about their bruxism habit and and they don't know whether to trust you or not so that patient who might not certain might not necessarily trust you if something was to go wrong because you know any appliance can cause uh, occlusion changes any appliance can cause uh, uh, changes in the temporomandibular joint and at the dental level so be careful when prescribing any type of appliance not just the anterior only ones um so if, if the patient doesn't trust me I might give them the cheapest, most simple appliance that is the safest um, and not likely to cause any issues uh, because it might just do enough for the patient. Because if the patient doesn't trust me, then I don't want to give them my everything. Because if things go wrong, then already you're on the back foot. So trust actually is an important factor when it comes to prescribing the best appliance for your patient. Okay, the next one is an interesting one, is um, ease of access and, and access in general. For example, uh, the other week I had an 80-something-year-old delightful lady, just an absolute comedian. She was just brilliant, full of life and so funny, but she did have um, early to moderate Alzheimer's disease uh, and her son would bring her in. Uh, and she lives a fair distance away. And really, we, you know, we spoke with her and her son and we thought that because of the distance she lives away, she, her, her main goal is to stay stable and to do the least amount of dentistry possible, but also to minimize the need for her to come to the surgery. So minimize any emergencies and whatnot. Uh, and other than lots of wear on her teeth, which you may expect, uh, it's common, but not normal. Like, you know, she's obviously been power functioning 
at a high rate throughout her life and she knew it. I mean, it's one of those patients that tell you, one of those rare patients that tell you that they've been grinding a lot. And she actually came with a, a chipped composite on the anterior, which I fixed for her. Uh, and, and then I spoke to her son, I spoke to her, and we decided to go for a splint. I'll tell you in the future why we did this and how we did this. Um, we decided a splint that was really low maintenance, easy to wear, and will not need many adjustments. Because if she lives a long while away and she depends on her son and she really wants to minimize the number of appointments and number of times she has to see me, and I want a low maintenance appliance that doesn't need a lot of close uh, sort of reviews and just checking how things are developing. Uh, so for her, it's just a protective appliance, which I'll describe in future episodes. Hopefully with, with some examples, I can show you these types of appliances. Uh, but the G splint for, for my patient there was one that factors in the fact that this patient cannot come to see me for, for stringent follow-up protocols. And I need to give a plug and play appliance that's gonna be easy for her to wear and compliance is almost guaranteed. So how far away your patient lives and how, how easily they're able to access your care will also affect which is the best splint for that patient. The next one is one that considers if your patient will be requiring any further dental work in the near future. Like you don't wanna be giving appliances to your patients who you know have poor oral hygiene, uh, have lots of large restorations with constantly fracturing cusps. Um, you wanna get your patient stable enough so that they're not gonna be, you know, you're not anticipating in, in doing lots of treatment on them in the future. You've stabilized all the caries. You've got everything pretty much stable enough because you don't want to give an appliance and spend so much time on it. And then suddenly, you know, uh, three months down the line, they need a new crown and then restoration and a root canal. And then things keep changing. And a lot of appliances, once things change, they don't fit so well or they need a lot of work and it's not as predictable. They're better off just having a new appliance. So you need to get a patient who is stable most of the time. Now, sometimes if they've got lots of work that's required, but all of it is conformative. So we're, we're sort of sticking to their occluding scheme and um, all of that work is gonna be posteriorly, for example. And maybe you need an appliance just to prevent them from doing any further damage. Then maybe in that case, an anterior only appliance may be the best splint. That could be the G splint for the patient. So factor in that if, if they will be likely in need, or maybe they've already got a treatment plan that they need to complete and just being a little bit slow, but that's all planned treatment. So think about the type of treatment that they may or will need in the future and how that may impact a constant need for new appliances. Is there a clever way that you can do it? So for example, one of the appliances I'll talk about in future episodes is called the FOS appliance, FOS, and I love it because if I'm gonna be doing a dial type case where I'm building up the anteriors, I just gouge it out uh, once I've built up their teeth and reline it to their teeth. It's the same splint, they're already used to it, but now I'm able to do new dentistry for them, yet still keep them on the same appliance. So have a think about if they need any further work, are they stable? We should really be doing appliances, for most type appliances, on stable patients. Now, obviously, if you're trying to deprogram them, like a diagnostic appliance, so get their sort of muscles relaxed prior to centric relation records uh, for a future rehabilitation, that's different. And again, if this is mumbo jumbo to you, don't worry, we're gonna cover it slowly and surely in the next few episodes. But bear in mind the need for any future dental work. And the last point to consider, I'm sure there are more and I'll probably cover them throughout the next few episodes in Splintemba, but the last one I want to consider is the best splint is the one that actually gets the job done. And what I mean by that is, um, I mean, a recent patient experience triggered this sort of point. Uh, and it's a patient I saw recently who has a lower left molar, which is pretty much last chance saloon. Like it's so weak uh, and every year she comes in, she breaks it and it gets restored. Uh, and she saw me as an emergency. So first time I saw her uh, and I said, look, this tooth really needs to come out. And she's like, look, I, I'm so desperate. She's about 23. I really don't want to lose this tooth. It's not causing me any pain. Please, 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 can you patch it up again? And I'm not into patch up dentistry, you know? I really try and convince my patients that, look, let's get it sorted once and for all. Now, she's a childminder and, and, and funds are, are not in the best place at the moment. So we think, how, what can we do to, to minimize the risk of, of this tooth uh, continually breaking away? Now, she's really good at not eating on that tooth, which I know is a massive shame, and I really hope she gets it fixed properly. But she wears an appliance as well, and her main issue is got this large muscle mastication, and she's a, you know, a strong 
power function or, or very strong signs of bruxism and she's aware of it. Again, one of those patients that really know, you know they really do it when they're aware of it, right? So her appliance is an upper one. So it just doesn't make sense if her weak tooth is the lower one, lower molar, and her appliance is the upper one, that when she's parafunctioning, that weak tooth, even though she's protecting it during the day by not eating on it, that weak tooth is parafunctioning on plastic, but it's still receiving the lateral loads of parafunction because she showed me the appliance and I had a look and every time she'd grind left and right, she's grinding on that weak tooth. No wonder it's breaking away despite her being so careful on it. So for that patient, don't you think, a lower appliance to actually uh, cover over gently that very vulnerable tooth would have been the better appliance. So it's got to be something that gets the job done. So those are some of the seven or eight factors which I think are important. And those are all the things that make up the G splint. So if, if you haven't sussed it out already, uh, I was only joking. There's no G splint uh, yet. I'm joking, there isn't. Uh, there's no Gulanti splint. Uh, and um, that was like an analogy, a comparison. Uh, a way to think. So the G splint is one that suits your patient's needs. The G splint is individual to every patient. That's what I was trying to get to basically. There's no one splint for every situation. And, and you now all those people that ask for a flowchart, I'll still try and make you a flowchart. But can you see the problem with having a flowchart um, in, in this sort of topic? Because there's so many different variables. And I think I've only just scratched the surface with this episode about which is the best appliance, because I'm going to talk about in depth uh, each and every appliance in the future episodes coming very soon. But can you see the complexities and how even if I make a flowchart, there's too many ifs and buts uh, and, and, you know, how far away do they live? Have they, have they, have, have they had orthodontics before? Do they snore? I mean, these are things that are so unique to every individual to decide which is the best appliance for that individual. So really, um, I hope that gives you food for thought about which makes the best splint. It's the G splint. It's the one that's best for your patient in front of you based on their individual needs. So I hope you found that useful uh, and check out the next few episodes of Splint Timber. Uh, I've got so much lined up for October as well. I'm recording a couple of times this month as well for future content to come out in November. Uh, hey, if you're looking to come to the Michael Melkus course, 27th and 28th of November, please check out occlusion2020.com uh, and, and let me know. I'm still recording these in September as I'm going along. So if you want to know anything uh, specific about splints, uh, please help me to, to sort of add that content in to the sort of series on splints, probably three or four more episodes to come this month and i hope you're enjoying splint timber uh, and join me for the rest thank you so much for tuning in all the way to the end on this episode which i know wasn't what you were expecting you were expecting me to say the michigan splint or a b splint or whatever is the best splint but no there's so much more to it than that and that's what makes this field so exciting uh and you know just for getting to too much i think but in the future episodes bear in mind that splints are are great and they can really help your patient but you don't want to be doing splints and that's it. You want to be doing the rehab as well. You want to be doing the fun dentistry. Splints are just part of it. Because guess what? Every time a really well-known dentist does a full mouth rehab, they're pretty much always getting a splint afterwards. So splints are also important, but they're not um, something that quite often is, is you know, have the splint and you'll be sorted for life. Although it, they can work that way, a lot of times the patients still need our dentistry. Uh, so, so that's sort of flavor we'll be going in the future episodes. Uh, and um, please subscribe to the newsletter on protrusive.co.uk. Thanks so much for listening. All the best. Mm -hmm.